recently for Locals of the Line, I've had quite a few requests to do Lord Nelson. And this is quite an interesting class. Only 15 ever built, and this is the last one remaining. Not owned by the railway, it's owned by the National Rail Museum or the National Collection. So effectively, you the taxpayer. So yes, let's look at the life of the Lord Nelsons. Before the Lord Nelson class came to be, the King Arthurs were capable of the heaviest express passenger work between London and the Southwest. At this time, there was a growth in demand for continental traffic travelling via Dover and Folkestone. By the mid-1920s, the Southern Railway Traffic Department expressed the desire to begin operating larger and therefore heavier trains over the routes. This required a new, bigger and more powerful design of the locomotive, which would need to fulfil two basic criteria. To be strong enough to haul trains with a weight of at least 500 tonnes, and at a speed of at least 55 miles an hour, so as not to impede the congested electrified lines around London. There was, however, a problem. Weight restrictions imposed by the railway's chief civil engineer, George Elson, of 21 tonnes per axle meant that it would not be possible to meet the speed and power requirements with a two-cylinder locomotive without exceeding the weight restrictions. Richard Mansell, the chief mechanical engineer for Southern Railway, secured agreement for a four-cylinder design with an improved boiler and bell pair firebox. The cylinder layout would be split evenly to better balance the wheel and reduce the vertical forces which adds to and subtracts from the locomotive's weights on the wheel known as hammer blow. This would also give the locomotive an unusual 8 beats per revolution instead of the usual 4 you would find on a two-cylinder locomotive, which in turn would provide greater torque and would also give a more constant draw of air through the fire. By the 1920s, new metals were available to the draftsmen, meaning they were able to save weight in the construction using thinner plate work and using high tensile steel for emotion parts and frames. In the end, the new 460 came out to be just one tonne heavier per axle than the last batch of N15s, quite an achievement for a locomotive with double the number of cylinders. The building of the class took place at Eastleigh Works, which at the time had become self-sufficient, with almost every component required to construct a locomotive being manufactured on site. From the foundry to machine shops to boiler shops to blacksmiths better known as smithies, Eastleigh was the most advanced railway works in Britain, and the ideal location to construct the new powerful class of locomotive. In June 1926, the frames of the prototype number 850 were cut out and laid down in the erecting shops, where it would take a little over two months to complete the construction. The large boiler featured superheating systems to make best use of the steam, and with a large grate in the firebox provided an exceptional rate for steam generation. Combined with the four 16.5 inch diameter cylinders with a 26 inch piston stroke, this gave the locomotive a tractive effort of over £33,000 at 85%, far in excess of a rival castle class from GWR and A1s from LNER. The eight-wheel tender was capable of carrying 5,000 gallons of water and was fitted with three vacuum reservoir cylinders which were mounted behind the coal space. All in all, the locomotive cost £9,510, a figure well in excess of half a million in today's money. When Lord Nelson emerged from Eastleigh, it would have been the largest locomotive to ever appear out of the works, measuring in at 69 foot, 9 and 3 quarter inches in length, and would be the longest locomotive on the southern region until after the Second World War. The time to test the new prototype had arrived, and on Friday the 13th of August 1926, Lord Nelson was allowed out of the gates at Eastleigh for a short proving test run to Mitchell just north of Winchester. On the two days after, the locomotive was used on five coach trains to Brockenhurst. 
there were only minor teething faults, which were rectified before Lord Nelson appeared at Waterloo Station for the first time on September 27th in its new livery and nameplates attached. There was no formal naming ceremony for the loco, as the London and South Western Railway had never traditionally named the locomotives, with exception of the N15s or King Arthur class, which was mainly done for publicity. Lord Nelson's first long run took place on the 4th of October, when it hauled a train from Waterloo to Bournemouth. However, the official press launch would come a week later. Marketed as the most powerful passenger engine in the British Isles, Lord Nelson departed Waterloo at 11am hauling the prestigious Atlantic Coast Express, which it took as far as Salisbury. Just two weeks later, Lord Nelson had its first royal appointment when the Duke and Duchess of York, who would later become King George VI and Queen Elizabeth the Queen Mother, travelled on the footplate whilst on a visit to Ashford Works. The date itself was October 20th, Trafalgar Day, making the use of Lord Nelson especially poignant. Despite the success of the design, it took a further two years before any more were built. Various theories range from Mansell not being convinced of a class's superiority over the King Arthur's. Was the Southern Railway's board more willing to spend their money on electrification, or did Mansell not press the case for his class as hard as he could have? Sadly, there is no way to find out. But this did disadvantage the class, since if there was only one locomotive, it could not work on anything other than trains designed for the other less powerful locomotives. Further runs proved to produce varying results, with the locomotive either struggling up banks or performing well, producing both high speeds and tractive effort. In the end, many of the difficulties were identified as inexperienced crews. As Lord Nelson was the sole member of the class for two years, and the crews were so devoid of regular contact with the engine and its new long firebox that getting it to steam effectively was very challenging. The remaining 15 members of the class were all outshopped between May 1928 and November 1929. Due to inconsistencies with steaming, a few of the class featured a minor individual modification, ranging from a reduced wheel size, a longer boiler, Normal 90 degree crank settings to give 4 beats rather than the 8 per revolution or a different variation of blast pipe. None of these made any significant difference though. After Mansell retired in 1937, Oliver Bullied became the chief mechanical engineer and set to work trying to improve the class. During 1938, he made a number of trips on the footplate and had his own thoughts about improvements that could be made. He fitted the class with a multiple blast pipe arrangement to increase the draft on the fire and the improvements were immediately noticeable. The piston valves were also rebuilt to be increased in diameter which again had a positive effect. The Lord Nelsons carried on hauling the big ticket express trains until bullied Pacifics started entering the arena. The merchant navies were starting to take hold of the express services, and the Lord Nelsons often found themselves on lesser duties unless a bullied was unavailable. It is often said that one of the main reasons for the indifferent performances was the fact that there were only 16 of them, and following the various modifications, not one of them was the same. That coupled with the fact that the crews did not get regular turns on the locomotives themselves. The last few years of their careers when they were all based at Eastleigh saw a marked improvement in their operation as the crews became more familiar with their vagrancies. It is often said that every shovelful of coal must be placed on a Nelson, and a good fireman was needed to get the best out of one. Eventually, the time had come for withdrawal and on the 18th of August 1962, Lord Nelson, along with 30860 Lord Hawke, were withdrawn from Eastleigh and sent for scrapping. 
the last of the class would be withdrawn just a few months later, with the last two lasting until October the 6th, 1962. That ended the 35-year career of the most powerful locomotive in Great Britain. When the Lord Nelson class was built, the publicity machine of the big four companies was in full swing, and it stood to reason that the company with the biggest, strongest, and most powerful locomotives were themselves a bigger, more successful company, and the one that every passenger will want to travel with. So imagine for a moment, you work for Great Western Railways, Southern's biggest rivals, and Southern Railway, your biggest rivals, come out saying they've produced the most powerful locomotive in England. What exactly do you do? You respond, of course. Sir Felix Pohl, the then chairman of the GWR, instructed his team at Swindon to build a locomotive that was more powerful than the Lord Nelson class. And this is what they came up with, the King class. First one unveiled was in June 1927, King George V, which is now on display in the National Rail Museum. Four cylinders of pure GWR power. Granted, it's a bit of a tangent, but I do so for a good reason. You see, the publicity war between the big four companies to try and make the biggest and most powerful engine to try and draw people to travelling with them produced some stunning pieces of machinery. When the Lord Nelson class was released, LNER were working on modifying their A1 and A3 locomotives and eventually would produce the A4, such as Mallard, which to this day still holds the world speed steam record. Fantastic bits of kit. But every company had one engine, at least, that went a little bit too far and were a bit too experimental and ultimately didn't work. For GWR, it was the Great Bear, which essentially was a king, bigger version, longer boiler. Unfortunately, reportedly, it just didn't steam well, didn't perform very well at all, not compared to other members of the class. Southern had the leader class designed by Bullied, which um, if I were to describe it, it looked like a diesel engine, cab at each end, steam loco in the middle. Once again, didn't really work. LNER had the uh, W1, codenamed the Hush Hush, as quite a few people called it. And that was experimentation into a high pressure water tube boiler. So instead of hot air passing through the water, it's water in the tubes passing through the hot air, like you see in vertical boilers. Ultimately, didn't really work. So yes, there's a lot you can read up on if you are interested in that sort of thing. Plenty of reading material both online and in books, and it's really interesting to see just how far companies went to try and produce the best and most powerful locomotives and the most inventive. And that's just steam. If you really want to go for it, one company went up for a gas turbine engine because they've seen its performance with machinery and they tried it with locomotives. Unfortunately, it didn't really work since you had a lot of starting and stopping with these things and that wasn't really the most efficient way of running a gas turbine engine. But, tangent over, now back to Lord Nelson and now we're going to look at its life in preservation with Chris Smith, a driver at the Watercrest Line and the engineering manager at the Talathrin Railway. Lord Nelson was kept for ordination. Um, it was withdrawn in around 1962, 63, and um, became part of the national collection. Um, so 850 was the first one of its class, so it was a bit special. Um, there's 15 Lord Nelsons to choose from, so they picked Lord Nelson itself. And it was stored at various places. Um, uh, I think uh, Fratton, um, it was down at Brighton. Um, it was various various places it was stored and then the uh, National Railway Museum actually opened up in York um, but uh, it didn't actually get stuffed and mounted it went into um, uh, Carnforth and Carnforth actually got it running restored it with Bob Meanley and a few few others and uh, it went out on the network and it did some rail tours up north uh, because in those days there were no mainline steam in the south because they had the steam band still on because everybody's terrified of the uh, of the juice rail it did some runs in the north and, and worked very well. It went over to Settle Carlisle and um, some of the northerners I've spoke to who've been on it said they just treated it like a Royal Scot and it was it really did the business. Um, anyway, that, that spell came to an end. So it was then um, uh, stored at Carnival for a while 
and uh, a little band called Eastleigh Railway Preservation Society had always had their eye on it. Um, and Lord Nelson, they'd actually um, uh, negotiated with the NRM to get Lord Nelson out off Carnforth and down to Eastleigh. So it was quite a triumphant day, really, because when it, it was actually built at Eastleigh in 1925, it was a prestige Southern loco. It was at the old, you know, bee's knees at, it, at the time. So to get Lord Nelson back to Eastleigh Works was really something. And um, so Earps, Earps, um got stuck into it and the, the boiler w was um, taken to Pridham's and that needed a, a really extensive repair. Um, that They actually had separated the barrel off the firebox. Um, and an old fitter called uh, Ron Cummins told me once that the Nelsons had weak boilers and um, they did have trouble in, in BR days. Um, but anyway, it had a very, very extensive repair, lots of new plate work, cost a fortune, um, used up a, a fair bit of Earps' money. It was lottery funded too. Um, but the result was that the boiler was fit for use again. Um, and it's the same boiler, it's not, not had to be replaced. Uh, and then time was getting on and unfortunately Allstom, who took over Eastleigh Works, decided it was going to be closed. And um, so Earps had, the, uh, had a sort of a time limit to finish the engine. Um, but it worked in their favour, I think, because in 2006 they actually put the engine into the works and were able to use the overhead cranes, um, which helped them a lot. Um, uh, so they, they, the engine was finished. Um, Princess Anne came down and uh, named it and they had a big ceremony. And then it was taken to West Somerset Railway behind the Class 66 and um, they did some test runs there. And then it did its first rail tour, was actually from the West Somerset to Eastleigh, which is what Harry Frist Sr. actually wanted. He wanted it to, to do its first rail tour, finish at Eastleigh un, in steam. So that, that's what, it, what happened. Um, they did a few more rail tours and um, uh, it, it did a trip to Exeter and unfortunately um, had a lot of leaks in the firebox at the end of that trip. Um, and the National Railway Museum um, got involved and the result was that there was a three-way partnership um, there was Earps, NRM and Midhants and it, it went to the Midhants and it uh, stayed there ever since. Um, so when it first came uh, it was quite interesting because we'd heard some old drivers from um, some old Eastleigh drivers who used to be at uh, Southampton Model Engineers. One loved them and one hated them and they used to argue and argue and argue about this and we started finding the same, you could see the same sort of arguments in, in our you know, new age footplate crews. Some could get the hang of it, others didn't like it. And it was, it was, it was comical that that sort of repeated itself. Um, so yeah, so it went to Midhance. Um, it went back to Eastleigh Works Open Day, towed by 37. I was lucky enough to go with it and that was a right giggle um, because we had a 37, Nelson, uh, Canadian Pacific, the Iver and three coaches for braking. So we went down to Eastleigh and back with that and that was, um, that was really something. So uh, yeah, so it carried on, it finished its boiler ticket in the mid -ants. Um A lot of the crews mastered it. Um, it just seemed to get better and better as it was running more and more. It just seemed to go better and better. I don't know if the blast pipe was carboning up or what, but so that's it really. So at the moment it's, it's not left outside, it's, it's tucked away in a boiler shop. And um, I don't know what the plans are, but um, I think um, you probably will see it run again. The Lord Nelson class truly were a remarkable piece of engineering and a fantastic class of locomotives not just for their size and their power but for the response they caused from gwr they responded with the king which granted it did pip the class to the post with regards to power it did have a drawback the king class were heavy far too heavy and uh, too heavy to operate on most of the GWR network and they were restricted into what routes they could take so you could see it as GWR building something more powerful and then shooting themselves in the foot because of it. If you look at the early LMS design for Royal Scott you'll notice quite a few similarities between the Scott and the Nelson because LMS appealed to the Southern Railway for a design of locomotive and they were given this. So they made their own modifications and that's how the Royal Scott was born. From a crew's perspective, we get asked a lot, what is our favorite locomotive? Which one do we love and which one do we hate? And Lord Nelson was certainly a Marmite. It was a love it or a hate it because it was so hard to get this beast to play ball. For me personally, I love this engine. 
It was one that you had to work for it. If you could get Lord Nelson to steam, you were having a good day. And it felt brilliant. And it also has a personal memory. Well, this is the engine I passed my farming test on and had my first day as a qualified fireman. It was a spring gala, and I remember we came down towards Rockley, got stopped at the signal while we were waiting for the platform to become available. So we took the opportunity, jumped onto the front and had a picture. It was wet, it was miserable. The water got onto the camera, so you couldn't see much, but it was one thing that needed to be done. Now, Lord Nelson is currently in the list in the queue awaiting overhaul. Understandably, coronavirus has pushed things back a little bit. So you can still come down and have a look from the viewing gallery at this beautiful piece of engineering. And hopefully it won't be too long before we'll be able to start work and return it to steam here at the Mid-Hans Railway, the Watercrest Line. <laughs>